Yeah, your meeting notes didn't disappear. They're not hidden. <laughs> At least not for me. Is that that's okay. like a, is that an automatic thing that comes up? Because it seems it Yeah. Seems and I don't want to troubleshoot it just now. So it's okay. Yeah. It'll give a transcript. I'll be curious what a transcript of this looks like. Sort of yeah, just playing around with it. The one when we were talking about Sue's situation, everything Sue said was shown as being me. <laughs> I was like, what? Well. Okay, I'm opening up the room. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Just sit tight for a minute. We're going to just hang and let a couple people trickle in. Sometimes people come in the first couple minutes. So sit back, relax. Back let me get back. everything settled here. Um, if we can just have our mute on, uh, unless you're speaking, that will be great. This is primarily going to be a, um, you know, educational based, webinar based uh, event. So it's not going to be uh, something that we're going to be doing a lot of sharing. Although there will be some time uh, towards the end if we'll have time for some Q and A and from just some discussion. So uh, if you want to grab a pen and paper, maybe take some notes. You might get some inspiration today. It might be helpful to have a notepad. Just a suggestion. And I'm just going to give it a few seconds here to just see if anybody else is going to trickle in. Uh, who's here today? Welcome, Kevin. Welcome, Alaya. Welcome, Andy. Dan. Sue. Tom. I believe you're here. I can't see everybody. Thank you. If you want to come off camera, it's always good to see. If you are if you can't, no big deal. Um, and we'll kind of get started in a few seconds here. Um, but let me introduce myself briefly in the meantime. My name is Joshua Lamoth, and I'm joined here with uh, my fellow webheads. We are uh, happy to be the sponsors of this event. We are a team of independent digital professionals, and we've come together to basically provide education, information, support, resources to the small business community, particularly as it relates to uh, improving your web presence, which is really the point of today's webinar. Make your website work for you. So we're going to hear from a few of us today, and we're going to present some information regarding some areas that you can use to make your website better and work better for you. It's not going to be a uh, detailed tutorial on anything, but basically some general information, some good information, some trends, some things to think about. And really what we're here to do is essentially introduce ourselves, demonstrate our expertise a bit, and be available to anyone here uh, post call that might want some one-on-one -on -one consultation or support, um, or maybe looking for some actual work. You'll have access to everybody here's uh, contact information and you're, you can reach out for a complimentary session. So there's no agendas. There's no nothing we're selling here. We're just here to give some information. Hopefully it's of value. Um, and it looks like it's about three minutes past the hour. So I'm probably just going to kick it off and we'll do some brief introductions to the webhead so we can uh, get everybody uh, to say hello. So let's start with uh, Paula. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula Roberts. I'm in San Diego today and most days. <laughs> I have Aqua Community Relations Group and I have been in my field for about 30 years. And Alea, thank you for sharing how to pronounce your name. I appreciate that. Awesome. Thanks, Paula. And thanks, Alea. Um, Robert. I'm Robert Cox. I have a Sylphium design uh, here in Northwest Pennsylvania. And I do uh, websites for nonprofits and small businesses in the environmental realm. Great. Pia. Hey, everyone. I'm Pia Sabletti of Sentium Associates, and um, I do websites and branding, uh, strategy, uh, graphics, and marketing for entrepreneurs and small businesses. And my name is Joshua Lamoth. I own Grassroots Consulting. 
I have worked for about 15 years with small business owners to help them to design, build, manage, and maintain their digital presence, uh, their messaging, and their branding, and help them connect with their best clients. So uh, collectively, we probably have, I don't know, 30 or 40 years worth of sort of experience in this industry here. So, you know, trends come and go, softwares comes and goes, but we've we've sort of had some tried and true stuff that we've stuck to that's that's worked and continues to work. So you can leverage our expertise. Um, basically, let me, uh, before we actually get in, I just want to kind of preface. So, you know, like I said, the, the, the event here is called Make Your Website Work For You, right? So presumably your website is not working or not working as well as it could in some area, one area, every area. Yeah, Tom, I see that. And, and most of us are probably here in one of three categories. We are trying to figure it out and banging our head against the wall. We are <laughs> hired a web developer uh, to do it and we're not really satisfied with their work or perhaps their communication or something just isn't working there. Or the third one is you've got nothing and you want to get started and you don't know where to start. So you're looking for support. We typically uh, will fall into one of those categories. So what we're going to be doing here today is just giving you some education from different perspectives on various parts of web design, uh, things to think about, things to take notes on, things to look at your own website and compare. Do I need that? Can I use that? Can I benefit from improving in that way? Is that a good strategy for me? That's kind of the thing. And then at the end of this, we'll have an opportunity to hear from anyone who wants to share what had you come here today what challenges you're working working on? Do you have any specific questions? Is there anything that you hear today in our conversation that you want to ask a follow-up to? And like I said earlier, you'll all have access to each and every one of us's contact information. So if you want to schedule a complimentary one-on-one, -on -one, we have that available. But again, I'll say it again because there's too much of this going around. No agenda. We're not here to sell you anything. We're just here to be helpful. So that being said, hopefully everybody's tracking with me. Give me a thumbs up if you're following along. Great, thanks. And let's otherwise not waste any time. Let's jump right into our first presentation, which will usually be about five to 10 minutes each. So uh, we're not going to bore you with details. It's going to be very high level. And our first speaker is going to be Pia. Step up, Pia. There you go. Yeah, everybody see that? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Um, again, my P my name is Pia Civiletti. And today I'm going to talk about before you build a website or redesign your website. Just some things to think about. And uh, here we go. We're going to cover three different topics today. Purpose, branding, and strategy. So in, in purpose, okay, um, there's some things you want to think about before you even start, but and a lot of this is, is before you even start, you know, building or, you know, getting into systems and doing anything. Um, is so you know, everything I've seen, I didn't look at it like this. All these, all these, <laughs> <questions>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, who are you, right? Who are you in relation to your business? Um, think about, are you selling you or are you selling a service that is detached from you yourself, right? Um, what type of business is it? And and why are you in the business? You know, so it's it could be, uh, maybe it's not to make money. Maybe it's something that you're just doing to serve community. Um, and maybe, maybe your main reason isn't to make money, right? So, but actually understanding all about what, you know, why are you building a website and why are you in business is actually really important. And it's, and a lot of times when I work with customers, they haven't answered these questions. You know, do you need a website, right? Some people will be like, well, you know, I do a lot of in-person things. I don't know if I really need one. In today's age, everybody needs a website. It's because most people that if they want to validate that you're a real business, they're going to go to the internet and look you up. So the best thing to have is a website to show that, you know, you're a real business, right? It wasn't like that 20, 30 years ago. And then if you don't have a website and you're just starting out, right, you're in a different position that you do have a website and you're redesigning, right? So is your website not working for you in some reason, right? Is it uh, is outdated in technology? Is it outdated in look? Um, 
as you did your business and the market changed, your strategy changed, did your website change with that, right? Is it is it still representing who you are as a business today? And what do you want to actually accomplish with your website? What is the purpose of the website? Is it to sell widgets? Is it to get people to sign up for your newsletter? Um, is it to get people to donate money? Um, are you selling a service? All of that is really important. And it could be, you know, one, two, three, or all of those, right? Um, so getting it straight, which one is the most important? And then, you know, prior, prioritizing that so that that will help you be able to build your website. So before you start to build, there's other things besides just the, you know, overall, who are you and, you know, what kind of business are you doing and that type of thing um, that you want to think about, right? Do you have an actual business plan? And when you build your website, you want to keep that in mind. What did you put in your business plan? What are your goals? Okay. Do you have a target market? Do you understand who your market is? You know, some markets prefer certain design looks and, and, a, and a certain way of uh, navigating, things like that. What are your differentiators? How are you positioning yourself in the market, right? Who, what, how, when, and why, right? Vision, mission, all those things you really, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, well, it's just one person, it's just me, you know, um, and that's, you know, not a big corporation that does all that. It doesn't matter. Even for just yourself, you really need to understand all of these areas. So you know really what you're selling, okay? The tangible things, your name, right? Does it, is your name catchy? Is it your name? Is it, you know, logo, taglines, colors, imagery? All of this plays um, into building your website. It also goes back to, in your business plan, what's your vision for who you are and what, you're, what you want people to see um, about your brand when they look at your website, right? Do they, is it a cheery type of business? Is it a serious business? Um, you know, what type of thing? So the name and the logo and the tagline and all those should go along with what type of uh, emotional response even that you want for your customers, okay? Uh, brand tools. Um, obviously, this is where your website comes in. This could be, you know, social media type things, but obviously we're talking about websites today. So this is your website. When you launch a new brand, so if you're not rebranding and you're a new company, um, and when I, you know, launching it internally and externally. Now, if you're just yourself and you don't have a company that has several other people, launching internally kind of sounds weird, but for somebody who just is by themselves, launch it to your friends and family, right? Send them a link, let them look at it. Ask them, hey, does this, seem right? Does it feel like it represents me? Does it seem like it represents my business? Is it easy to uh, get around the site? Do you understand it? Like, you know me, you know, do you understand it? So it's kind of uh, really good to get a bunch of other people's eyes on it, just to give you opinion on, on uh, what they think about it. And then even after you launch a brand, you're going to keep building on that, right? You, you do your business plan, you get your website going, you look at all these things, and it doesn't stop then. You're always developing your brand. Every year you gotta look at, you know, what's new in the market? What's your competitors doing, right? So you're continuously tweaking your brand, tweaking the words you're using. You know, is it something that you look at social media and see what words are people using today? Well, maybe you need to change your wording because it's gonna help you get a lot more visibility that way. All right. Strategy. So strategy uh, encompasses so many different things, but for the website specifically, um, we're looking at, you know, one, your blueprint. So being able to document how people are going to navigate your website and what your site map is, meaning what are all the pages, what are all the points of information that you're going to include on your website? And it's a really good idea to understand that before you start building it. Um, and that will come in your menu. So navigation will be, you know, your menu items. And then your site map, there may be pages that you have on your website that is not in the menu, right? They could be maybe things that you get to through links throughout your pages. So laying that all out is really a good, uh, a good idea. Um, and so if you see up here in the right-hand corner, 
You can even do like, you can use word. You can use anything to lay it out, right? Even if it's on a piece of paper, you can lay it out that way. You draw it, whatever, it doesn't matter. So function, what do you want your visitors to do? What action do you want them to take? This is really important because once they get to the website and they see your you know, pretty picture you know, coming up or just a graphic that's really you know, vibrant and everything, and then they go, okay, so what are, what are they doing? Where, where do I go? What do I do? How do I find what I need to find? Um, so making sure that that first thing that you want to look at is it that you want them to sign up for a newsletter? So you need to have that, make sure that the first action they see is to sign up for a newsletter. If it's uh, you're selling, you have a shop, the first thing you want them to see is where's the shop, right? You want them to go look at your products. Systems and software, okay? So a lot of, a lot of things encompass systems and software. You have your hosting providers, the platforms that you're going to have your website on, like WordPress, for example. Your page builders, those are the things that work on top of WordPress that you use to build your website. Themes and templates are also uh, used to help build your website, and they usually work with the page builder. And then you have all other software and plug plugins. So you look at it and say, do I, do I have a CRM tool, right? Something that I use to track leads that's outside of my website. Do I want to integrate that? Do I have an email system that I want to integrate? So you kind of have to look at all those different types of systems and software to see how do you want it to work with your website? And if you don't have one, do you want to integrate? Do you want to do something that's integrated into your website and isn't necessarily external to your website? Um, next, you'll have the aesthetics, right? So once you decide on all the tools and everything, and you may already have this laid out before you pick your tools, but again, like the site map, Sometimes it really helps to be able to lay out your design. What colors are you using and how are you going to use that on the website? The fonts are really important as well. What type of fonts are you going to use? Usually you try to stick to, you know, about two fonts, one for titles, one for um, text. You could use one font. Usually best not to go over three different types of fonts and not trying to do too many different sizes and styles even of those fonts, right? Um, images and graphics, really important here is that if you're going to use an image, make sure it's a high quality image and that it's very clear. Anything that's slightly blurry really takes down the quality of your website. So if you have pictures that you're putting up for like your bio and that type of thing, if they're not really good pictures, either get more done, get someone professional to take it, but just make sure they're super clear. Uh, video is really big now on uh, websites and uh, helps people keep them engaged, right? Um, content, so what are you gonna say to your visitors? Um, this is really important. You don't wanna have too much and you don't wanna have too little. And then understanding who your end customer is, are they readers? You know, maybe you you have a certain product or a service that your your customers are really big readers. Well, you probably could put more content on there and they'll probably read it because they like it. Is it a younger uh, audience? Like, are they Gen X's? And they're like, if it's more than two sentences, I'm not reading it, right? So it's gotta be quick, 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 right? So maybe it's pictures and graphs and things like that that'll catch their attention. And as time goes on, as we talked about branding, you have to look at when your audience either evolves or changes is it changing in you know, demographics, age, that type of thing? And then you need to look at your website in that reference as well. And then performance. The reason you have a website is to get customers, but to if you don't have actual you know, uh, proof that you're getting customers, you're selling things, it would also be great to know, well, is anybody even going to the website? Is anyone finding the website? How long are they staying on the website? What pages are they finding? These statistics are really important for you that you can always use like Google stats and there's different SEO type software that you can use set up to give you those numbers because they can tell you whether or not your you know, website's working for you, right? Sometimes people are going to your website, but you're still not getting a sale. So is there a different issue going on that you actually have traffic, but they're not buying? That could be content, or you're attracting the wrong people to your website. 
So those are the, that's why stats are really important because they help you out with those things. Building it right, and then they will come, right? So going through all these steps, it could be sometimes painful and it takes a little bit longer time, but it helps you build the website right the first time. You want to make sure that you keep your customers on the website as long as you can, right? Making it readable and making sure that the content flows and makes sense and flow, and it's easy to use. Or is it easy to see the text? Is it easy for people to see the buttons that they have to click on for the actions that you want them to do, right? Is it just, is it easy for them to find what they want to find, right? Those things are all very, very important. Measure your success, as I talked about, and then make changes based on what your performance is saying, right? Sales and the stats of who's coming to your website and what pages are they going to? And doing obviously some SEO. And then you're gonna, of course, evolve as this goes along. So that was the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, feel free to join me in a breakout session to ask more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. Yeah. Thank you for that valuable information. There's a lot there, but as you can see, we, we're trying to give a taste of various aspects so you can all kind of get a sense of where in your challenges do you fit and where do you think you might need to focus on? So thank you, Pia. And I'm going to put uh, a couple times during this chat, I'm going to put a link uh, that you could click at any point. This will get you to the directory, which has myself, Pia, Paula, and Robert's contact info. Some people um, maybe they have to jump a little quick and they want to know our contact information. I'll just put it there after each speaker so we can just sort of reference that. And if you just click it, it'll be open. All right, let's move right along to the next uh, person we have in line here. It's going to be Robert. Hey, Robert. Hi, everybody. We'll be talking about blogging, which was uh, the content that uh, Pia talked about. And um, I have Sophian Design here in Northwest Pennsylvania. So uh, what is a blog? Well, a blog's an informational website or online journal that's actually a part of your website. And uh, you, you put out information by putting um, displaying posts on different topics related to your business or your nonprofit. And uh, these posts can contain text, images, videos, uh, or links to other pages and posts. So after your website is launched, you want to start working on your blog. And a blog is like laying crab pots. The more pots or posts that you write, the more crabs or users you can catch. And I'm not calling your users crabs, but I think you get the idea that you know, the more you put out, the more you can, uh, more engagement you can get on your website. So what are the benefits of a blog? Well, it drives website conversions if you're trying to spotlight a particular product, a particular aspect of a product, or try to put out news of your company, you can help drive conversions to your business. Uh, establish you and or your company as an authority in your subject or industry. Uh, you can show what you know and uh, build credibility. Uh, develops interactivity and relationships uh, with customers. People can comment on your blog and you can comment back or provide more information guided to their questions. And it reinforces your brand, uh, puts it more out there and gives your brand more visibility. Uh, and it differentiates your business from your competitors. Also blogs and blog posts have a longer li lifespan than ads and are considered effective by marketers and by the biggest, a bigger return or investment. So if you have an ad, your ad might include a sale that goes on until X date. Well, a blog can continue on or a post can, can continue on. But beware, it can take six to 12 months to see the investment sometimes. And also you want to have clear call to actions on your blog, not only on your website, but also in your blog post so people can directly go to whatever offer uh, or thing you're trying to uh, get engagement with. Also, it can provide content for your social media. Uh, you can take it directly from your blog post, put it on your social media. Sometimes it has to be adapted to the, to the particular social media. 
but it uh, help, can help provide that content. Also can automatically provide content by going out on an RSS feed um, as emails, newsletters, or other social media channels that accept RSS. So what are some examples? Facebook, Instagram, um, the Fediverse versions, Peer2, PixelFed, X or formerly Twitter, Mastodon, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Quora, Reddit, or uh, Wikipedia or Medium. And it really depends on where your audience is to which social media you want to use. And there can really be a big difference. And I've seen that on my blog. I had trouble with my blog on Facebook, but I did really well on Pinterest. So you really want to try to figure out where your audience is in picking your social media. So your, uh, your blog post can help build trust uh, better than an ad can. You can answer questions through comments, or you can have a frequently asked question section on your blog post. You can provide news or information on your company. And also, I said, you can build credibility or authority and show that you know what you're talking about. And you can differentiate your differences of your company versus your competitors. Why are you better than they are? Or what do you do differently that they can't do? Uh, having consistent blog posts can also reinforce it, your brand by putting it consistently out there. People will see it over and over again and get familiar uh, with what you have to offer. Uh, so you can use uh, keywords related to your company's products and services, which not only communicates your message more effectively, but also helps you rank higher or in a Google search. So what are the drawbacks? It take a lot of time to rank on Google. Uh, something called the Google Sandbox it takes about four to six months. And I've found somewhere around 75 posts or more, uh, depending on your niche, to, to really start to uh, get out there. But once you've hit that, hit that amount and your traffic starts building, then it's a lot easier to do. Uh, it takes a lot of consistency and persistence. You just have to keep going at it. And you have to believe you'll get there. Uh, you don't want to quit when you're just out, when you're halfway through because if you quit, you're going, you're done. Competitions can be fierce for rankings and SEO, especially on those keywords that are ranked high or being used by a lot of others. So you want to try to find a what's called a long tail keyword or something that um, others aren't using. And you want to promote your blog outside your site, i.e., social media. And I talked about competition being fierce for rankings. One thing you want to do to help with your competition, and I'm showing it up here, is you want to try to use uh, a Hortus Third, which I use a lot in my blog, which is a guide to uh, cultivated plants. But you want to try to use industry white papers or other things that are not or in other websites, but are actually in the printed literature. If you're doing that, then you have something different than what others are offering. And that can help you um, rank a little better and that shows Google that you have something different in your blog than, than others have. Well, you can't really <clears throat> get a, a conversation on blogging without talking about chat GPT. Uh, artificial intelligence is really making its way into blogging, writing, and uh, other forms. Uh, some people say you can write a lot more blog posts. Uh, I haven't really found that, but you want to make sure that the information you generate using AI is actually accurate. I would use it for subjects that you know a lot about so you can really proof it. And also use the text generate as a suggestion and go from there. Because a lot of times you don't know where the information came from. And the more references you have in your blog, the more um, credible it is. So I have an example here, if I can make the transition. This is from my my blog or my garden shop. And uh, this was one that I did on Curtis milkweed, uh, which is a, a milkweed in Florida. And milkweeds are used by monarch butterflies. Uh, it's a very common plant for butterfly gardeners. But I have a table of contents here with links going to each of the sections. If you're looking for a specific thing you want to find. And I have it broken down into headings. So information is easy, easily found. Uh, you have your introduction. Here in this uh, particular milkweed is found on Lake Wells Ridge in the middle of Florida. It's one of the rarest milkweeds in um, the US. 
Here I have pictures of the flowers, physical descriptions, its range, uh, habitats, you know, all different things about this plant. And um, this plant isn't in cultivation because it's considered a, a federal threatened species. But if it was in cultivation, I would have a call to action here of uh, places where you can go buy seeds or plants of, this, of the particular plant I'm talking about. And then I have a reference section here. So this is an example of a blog. And then another blogging resource is um, Ryan Robinson at ryrob, R-Y-R-O-B dot com. has a very good um, blogging page, and he has some really good tools on keywords and um, other things that you can use in blogging. Now, I was going to make a list here, but this guy has a really good website on it, so you can go here and find anything you want to really know about blogging. So questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Robert. That's really important. I, I often tell my clients, you know, we're going to be launch, just like Robert said, once you launch the website, the, the number one thing you can do for yourself, it takes time. It doesn't have to take money. And it's related to the uh, the the all important SEO conversation is creating a blog. You know, it, it continues to add more and more and more hopefully valuable and relevant content to your site. And you have full control over how much or how little you do. Uh, but like Robert said, if you hit a certain threshold, uh, it's going to pay off. So if a blogging strategy is something you've considered or are considering, um, you might want to uh, reach out to Robert. And again, I'm going to just put uh, a link to the general um, directory if at any point you'd like to ask a question. And I see, Robert, there's some questions for you in the chat, so you can address okay. them in the, okay. in the chat as well. Um Great. Thank you all for sticking sticking through here. We've got one more speaker left. We're going to hear from Paula. And then after that, we can open it up if anybody has any specific questions or comments uh, about their own project or struggles or uh, anything that we said here today, then we'll, we'll take a couple uh, questions as time permits. So, uh, Paula, come on up. Okay, let me share my screen. Doing the wrong thing here because my, my pictures of all the little people here are in the way. So let's go. Okay. I'm going to talk to you today about freshening up your website by using the three C's. We're going to talk about color, content, and calls to action. And these will all tie back in some ways to the things that Pia and Robert shared. The first thing I wanna talk about with color is to talk about color theory. And a lot of people don't think they know much about color theory, but you wanna start with your brand color if you have one. And then you can look at things like a monochromatic color scheme, which is all different shades of one color. You can look at analogous, which is side by side. So like, for example, blue and green are next to each other on the color wheel. And so they pair really well together in analogous scenes. And a triad goes like to three points on the circle. So like the primary colors, the red, blue, yellow that we're using in the web heads logo or graphics we're using today is a triad scheme. Um, and then what you would do is pick up to three colors and then maybe some, some shades of darker and lighter to help draw emphasis or depth. And there, I've given you a couple of links here where you can take a look at some do-it-yourself tools and see things you like. So Adobe offers a color wheel and they'll let you actually choose the kind of scheme you wanna use. And then on coolers, it's a, a really cute little site where you kind of just hit a space bar and it gives you another strip of color like the one shown here. Color is you know, famous for setting a mood. It can denote anything from credibility to being outrageous. It can look for luxury or, or convey speed. So. Make sure that whatever you're choosing, it doesn't compete with the mood that you want to set or convey for your customers. Look at colors that are used by other firms in your industry. Look at, you know, what your customers are liking, what your competitors, your vendors, even, you know, um, people who do things that are related to you. 
And I have two examples here up at the top. I've got a little toy that's kind of in the King's colors. You know, hey, Paula, we can't my... see your screen changing. Sorry to interrupt. It just, um, oh, it's, it's kind of stuck on the home slide. Oh, it says it's paused. Okay, resume. Does that fix it? No. Hmm. Should I try to redo it? I, I think maybe just follow. try to reshare. Reshare might help. Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody can follow along. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Just one sec. Yeah, I apologize. It looked fine for me, of course. You know, your content's so good. I want everybody to see the see the slides. Yeah. Um. Okay. Now it just says click to exit full screen. Let's go back to presenting. There. Now can everybody see the new slide? Yeah, there's a car there. Okay, great. And you should see uh, a little Kings thing. Do you see that as well? Yes. yes. Well, it's not Kings. It's a, it's a drum set, which I didn't see until I zoomed way in. But um, the reason I chose this is because I've worked in the public water industry for years. And purple is the color for reclaimed water pipes. So if you, for example, were a Kings fan and you wanted to use the Kings colors in your logo, but you were ha operating one of those fresh water stores, that would not be a great choice. Um, and this little red car, um, think about the colors you see in fast food places. The colors that are used in their branding and in their decor are all designed to convey speed and to get you in and out of the restaurant really quickly. And if there's anybody who would like to um, have a little breakdown on color moods, I have a series of posts I'd be happy to share. Oops, I went back. So another thing I like to think about when I'm using color is the rule of three. As designers, we're trained to balance white, which is negative space. So it could be any color, but basically whatever is blank on your page. Black, which doesn't have to be black, but anything that's drawing attention like headlines, illustrations, and color elements, and then gray, the blocks of text. So you do not want your text in general to take up more than a third of the page. And it, in fact, the latest rule that I'll share later is that it's, it should be like 50-50 um, of, of text to blank space or illustrations. And we wanna make sure we don't try to fill up the page because our eyes need places to rest and negative space makes the important things stand out. So now we're gonna talk about a few trends. So one of the trends is to really limit color, do a lot of black and white. And if you do an element on the page that does have color, it draws more attention to us. So, so in this, you know, the, the above the fold is all black and white. And then if you scroll down a bit to the about us, you get to see one color picture, but it's very muted. And it just really sets a particular tone for this, which is they're kind of a storytelling brand. And then one of our members, Sula Chappelle, she also has a black and white. And she brings in the color to share her portfolio. So she makes her customers stand out. Another trend that you're seeing more and more on websites is they'll do a dark version. So that if you see up in the top here where I'm moving my little circle, there's a switch. So you can choose whether you want dark or light version. And this helps with some visual impairments, but it is it also makes it more difficult for people with dyslexia. So you have to use it judiciously. And here's the second example of this. And he is, rather than saying dark versus light, he says work mode and play mode. So it already gives you a sense of his personality and what kind of image and emotion he wants to convey. Another thing you can look at when you're trying to choose colors to refresh your website is what are the colors of the year? Pantone, which is the, you know, basically the gods of print. Um, they've been doing all the color formations for ink um, for decades. They do a color of the year. This year it was Viva, Viva Magenta. And so they not only tell you their color, but they give you a suggested palette you could go along use along with those colors. And it, 
And for me, I've found that usually if you look at any of the recent colors, you're still as a website going to be pretty up to date. This, this particular website that I use this illustration from does a trending color palette. So I've provided the link when you get the um, handouts, you can go and look at other examples like this one which is based on decorating colors, the Benjamin Moore colors for their paint. You can also look at what's trending in logos. So currently what's, what's hot are the vintage aesthetic, like that hit the doll example there, modern mid-century, which is kind of in line with the Benjamin Moore palette, um, blinding lights like this one with shape in the middle, those really bright neon colors. Um, earthy colors like the green palette over here. Um, you'll see a lot of with terracottas and muted browns and greens. Um, and then post-apocalyptic futurism with the dark purples and blacks and grays and maybe some metallics thrown in. And that tops off my color ideas. Now here's content. When you write content, you wanna remember you're writing for humans. So tell a story, describe your service or product as though you're talking to a past customer you haven't seen for a while, or maybe your kindergarten teacher. This is one I use a lot when I'm working with public agency clients like engineers who get really kind of wrapped up in, you know, wanting to impress their peers when they tell a story, but really your customer may not know what your peers do. So you want to remember, talk to them as though they're an intelligent person that you admire, but boil it down into to language that anybody could understand. Here's an example from um, the parent company for WordPress. We're an overnight success. 13 years in the making. In 2009, our founder and CEO, Syed Balki, started a free blog called WP Beginner to help non-techie small business owners learn how to build and grow their websites. And before we knew it, we were making software used by 25 million websites. That's helping to shape the web for billions worldwide. What does that tell me about, about this company? One, it's like they understand success doesn't come overnight. Two, they are a little bit quirky and fun. And three, you know, they're very well established. So I think that those are, you know, it's a great way to get your point across without just being all techie. But when you're writing content, even though you're writing it for humans, you have to remember to also write it for Google or any search engine. The robots don't know all the things you do. So if you, for example, are making Danish furniture, you want to make sure that Google knows that you're making Scandinavian furniture. If you're doing watercolor paintings, you want Google to know that you have fine art. And if people are looking for art classes that you teach, you want to say art classes. And if you, if people are looking for a local artist, you want to make sure artist is on your website. So um, it's really helpful to do some research with this or to have use an SEO tool like SEMrush or to talk to somebody who can help you see if you've got the right terms in your content to write for Google. And generally what we try to do is to do one main keyword per page so that Google doesn't get confused. In this slide is all about, can you put yourself in another person's shoes? As your customer, I want to feel heard. I want to look great in my brand or feel good because I made this purchase. So show me you can help me achieve my hopes and dreams. And be you. This is just an astounding statistic to me that millennials consider authenticity in 90% of their purchases. And I can say that this stretches a little bit higher as well because my daughter in her early 30s, it's a key component for her purchases. This is something I think Robert um, demonstrated really well in his blog example is making content skimmable. If you're telling a longer story, you really wanna make sure that people can find their way because 
if if it looks too dense, you're going to lose them in less than 15 seconds. So in this case, this particular article started with a big headline above here. Then it's got their standard um, paragraph space um, text and a nice spacing before the next time. And then they're using a pullout, you know, like a quote in a different text. So you see that it's something else you can read. And they've got their their directory over on the side related to it. Um, here's another one from the Obama Foundation where the text is broken up by really nice large photos and videos. And then the paragraphs again are small with large space in between them and highlighted text so that you can read more rather than putting everything on that same page and making it too dense to read. So that this is um, important on your content pages. It's even more important on your homepage because the research says that most people leave your homepage within eight seconds if they don't find a reason to stay. And when you're writing content, search engines often like a thousand words. You know, I, I think the, the quoted range is 800 to 1200. But when you're writing for humans, most of them like about 300. That's a Nielsen survey. Um, so, you know, if you can say it in a shorter amount, don't write it for Google unless that, you know, there's particular SEO goals you have related to what you're writing about. Tell your story quickly. Don't get yourself the dreaded TLDR, which is too long, don't read, notation by your readers and visitors. And then um, on the bottom point, don't forget the numbered list. People, people love those. They like them in your social media posts, but they also like them in your content on your website. And finally, as I mentioned, there is a 50-50 rule for text and visuals. And so wherever you can tell you know, your story with a picture, think about doing something that's an infographic or something fun like this where it's interactive. You can tell those numbers um, for the male that was moving as I took this screenshot. This is a MailChimp example. And we're on to CTAs. CTAs or calls to action are the things that you want your customers to do once, you, once they get to your website. If they're easy to find and they stand out, you're gonna get twice as many clicks. So use an accent color like your, you know, if your brand color is a color that doesn't lend itself very much to, to text or it's not your background color, consider using that for your call to action. Um, surround them by a lot of white space in most cases. And often it's really good to include them above the fold um, so that people, it's not as important for your first time visitors because they're going to want to read some more before they click. But if you have a returning visitor who just wants to get a hold of you right now, or they're already ready to, to book with you, then having it right there above the fold means that you're making it convenient for them. It's not set up for you, it's set up for them. When you write a CTA, you want to keep it simple, use action verbs, create urgency and be creative. So in this one, you're creating urgency by saying, be the first to glow, you know, and then the action verb is sign up and save. Um, and it, the whole approach of course is creative. Here are some trending CTAs to get you started as you're thinking about what you wanna tell your customers to do. You can tell them they're gonna save 50% or they can try 30 days free. See my hundred switch to them. They can shop particular thing like fall outfits or the get weekly goodies that was used by somebody who writes a cooking blog. Sign up for your escape. Believe that's an Airbnb or similar company. Remember everything, which is a to-do list app. Get started or get started for free. Give us a try, continue. Or is in this escape um, example from Hulu, Disney, and ESPN, get the bundle. And that's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to talk to anyone after. Thank you. Thank you, Paula.
Those are great examples. I hope everybody got to benefit from seeing visually some of this stuff. Uh, it's one thing to talk about. It's another thing to actually have an idea and hopefully inspire something uh, within you. So that that more or less uh, brings us... Mention yeah. um, Joshua, in the, in the presentation, when you get the copy of our slides, um, the links for, for the color websites, I don't think are live, but on the examples I gave, I did put a live link. So you can go and scroll through those web pages and see what they were doing there. Oh, that's great. Well, since you mentioned it, I might as well bring it up now. Um, we do offer everybody here all the slides. We compiled them for everybody to have. Um, there's just one catch. Uh, we don't ask for much, but we would love it if you could take just a few minutes of your time at the end of our uh, meeting here today and fill out a very brief survey. It helps us to know what we're doing well, what we're doing poorly, how we can do better and serve people like you better. And you will get a copy of the today's uh, presentations there. So I'll paste it now. I was going to do it at the end, but I think Paula brought it up. It's perfect. I'll paste it here. Um, again, we're not, no agendas, but we do have things we can help each other. Um, so that pretty much brings us to the end of the presentation portion. Usually we either can end the meeting at this point, or if anybody uh, would like to come off mute and share, the particular thing we're looking for is, you know, what had you come here today? What is it that you're particularly struggling with? Where can you use some support? Because after all of this information that we presented, the reality is we don't actually advocate you do much of any of it on your own. We really think that it's important to partner with a re or collaborate with a partner such as anyone here or Webheads or anyone you find out there in the world that you can trust, who knows strategy, who can ask you good questions, who can help guide you to create this th this this map and then turn that into a beautiful functional modern web presence that works. So um, that's why we're here mostly is to be available for one-on-ones and talk about how we can help you if we can help you. Um, but if there's anybody here who wants to raise your hand virtual or um, or uh, what would you call it? D digital hand here or regular hand here, physical hand. Um, we could take some sharing just, just uh, and give you some feedback right here live to the best we can. I see Hazel's hand up. You want to come off mute, Hazel? Hi there. Um, sorry, I'm traveling. So <laughs> um, I am in the process of um, doing a new website and I'm looking for payment gateways. It's a WordPress website and there's just so many out there. Uh, I have a product, I have a book that I'm selling as well as services as well. Can you direct me in terms of where to find the best payment plugin for a WordPress website? Yes, definitely. Uh, I'll start and then I'll open it up. The pre pre preeminent WordPress uh, e-commerce integration is WooCommerce. Uh, so are, are, first I'll ask you, are you familiar at all with WooCommerce, W-O-O -O Commerce, Hazel? Yes, I've heard, of, um, I've heard of it. I haven't really started investigating yet. Um, so that's good to know. Yeah, I, I'm just going to point you towards that to investigate because if you want to integrate um, the ability to basically have products and a very simple, straightforward, I could get complicated, but I imagine you want to keep it simple, um, straightforward, okay. just purchasing, adding an item to a cart or items to a cart, purchasing, going through, connecting with uh, something like Stripe or PayPal. Uh, having that whole process yes. be seamless and also sending them receipts and reminder emails. When it comes to WordPress, um, WooCommerce is probably the highest recommended. If 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 you want to, well, I'll leave it up to any other webheads if they have any other alternatives to WooCommerce, maybe you want to mention. I appreciate or say, that. Thank you. Or say any more. Any, any of the webheads want to give another alternative or just point to something yeah. that Hazel might need to know? I could talk about it. Um, so, I mean, in, you could do a plugin like WooCommerce um, or if you need payment processing, you can also do it, you know, via using code, they call it APIs. You can use PayPal, you can use Stripe, you can use Square. Um, and you might want to, depending on how you do your banking as well, you might ask them what type of uh, payment, uh, you know, technology they have to go into websites. So sometimes they have the stuff already built up for you and you could just put it on your website and then the the, the money will go right into your, your bank account. So depending on how your finance is set up, could drive right. 
how you decide to do it. Okay, good point, thank you. Yes, anyone else, any other uh, webheads wanna add to that conversation at, at all? Robert, Paula, no? Well, okay. like Josh, I would recommend WooCommerce. That's what I use. And it's you know seamlessly integrated to, to WordPress. Absolutely. And Hazel, I'm pretty proficient with that. I'm sure Paula and I mean, uh, Pia and Robert are as well. I'm not sure, Paula, if you do uh, that kind of e-commerce stuff. So no. But if you want to if you want to reach out to do, um, you know, to have a more conversation about technically helping you and, and providing support, you can you can follow the link at the chat to our um, to our directory. And we're happy to have a larger conversation. But hopefully that was helpful enough for for the moment. Um, it definitely was. Take... Thank you. Great. Great, Hazel. Thank you. Let's take Lawrence. Hey, hello. How are you doing today? Hey, Lawrence. How are you? Wonderful. Excellent presentations by everyone. Uh, basically, I came here to uh, get some feedback on my website. I'm a consultant. I do career consulting, uh, financial literacy, and uh, credit repair. So it's, uh, you know, I put my link, my uh, email in my website there. Anyone can, you know, give me some feedback on the launch page and uh, the verbiage. I've learned some techniques that I'm going to use eventually, do some research. Uh, I think uh, some things I could add to the website. So just looking to, you know, get some feedback. Um, I think it flows very well as far as the, the pages and the color screen is pretty decent. Uh, just need a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, feedback on um, how well it integrates with, you know, when people go to the website. So that's why I'm here. Perfect. Well, thank you. And each and every one of us offers a complimentary introductory call where we can do basically an audit. Uh, the way that I okay. do it is we would have a, con just sharing for myself, uh, we would have a conversation and basically talk about what are your goals and what are your intentions for the site. And then we can start to compare what you have by mm -hmm. different uh, sort of elements as we talked about today to see, okay, improving this might help with your goal or rearranging mm -hmm. this or using integrating this and give you some sort mm -hmm. of feedback that way. So okay. I know you can reach out to me on that directory and we can schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. And if, if anybody else sure. uh, thinks, thinks that they could have a call with Lawrence, you can raise your hand web heads and he can reach out to you guys, but that's the idea too. We, you know, reach out to each and every one of us, have a conversation, see our approaches, see our angles, get our feedback, absorb it all. And if it, at the end of the day, one of us or more than one of us is someone you might want to work with in a particular area, you know, at least you got to know us a little bit more on that one-on-one -on -one call. So is that helpful, Lawrence? Yes, excellent. Thank you. Yes, it is. Okay, great. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Robert asked, um, he doesn't have he has a lot of valuable content but he's not sure he has enough for both a blog and a newsletter and asked for our thoughts um i'll start with that um robert a lot of times your audience for the two are different a blog is one way to keep it out there as long as you keep updating it it would would be available for people to discover you later and it's kind of like um, I'm a reader. So if I find an author I like, I'll go back and binge all their past series, right? Um, and so so somebody who just found you, if it's in your blog, they can go back and find it. And it's especially helpful if you've updated it with the latest data or changes in, you know, that relate to that post. Um, and um, really, one of the keys with social media and your newsletter and everything is repurposing it. So, so when you put together your newsletter, what pieces of that might go into a longer article for a blog or, you know, what pieces of it would work well as social media pieces. So, so look at it as um, a creation process that could feed multiple things. That would be my suggestion. I'll let the others pop in. Yeah, I, uh, I responded back to Tom, but I just did it uh, directly. But uh, yeah, I did try a newsletter and a blog. And I found out I was cannibalizing the blog to get the newsletter out. And uh, I was really tanking the traffic on my website. So in order to kind of combine the two, I uh, set my blog out on an RSS feed and tried to get people to subscribe to my RSS. And that way, when I wrote the blog post, it would go out to those who had subscribed on the feed. And in a sense, I got both combined together. Yeah. That's, that's usually, I mean, a lot of times people send out a newsletter. You may have some info, a little bit of information outside of 
links with a small excerpt of different blogs that you have. I mean, it's always, rule is always to get your uh, prospects to go to your website site and spend as much time as you can on the website. Um, you have stats as far as, you know, oh, who opens my, uh, you know, the newsletter, you can do that. But it's uh, sometimes it's a little bit more accurate to, to get them to your website so you could see what pages on your website um, is getting a lot of traffic. Because that might tell you, well, maybe I need to have more blogs about a particular topic because they keep on going to certain areas. So usually the newsletter, especially too, I mean, if you don't do a newsletter now and you don't have a big email list, like, you know, something that we're sending out to, well, sometimes it's not, you know, even worth setting that up until you get enough people. Um, and unless you know that your end audience are big email readers type of thing, right? So it's not too hard to switch your blog into a newsletter. That's an easy thing to do, right? Um, but it's it's definitely better as, in as far as Google because Google gives you a lot of credit when you have a good blog and people get into it. So there's a couple things like that to, to you know take in uh, consideration. All right, great. Thank you, Pia. Thank you, Robert. Um, any other final questions? It's getting to the top of the hour here. So other than yes. that, unless there's any others, yes. Uh, in reference to the blogging, um, consider doing a blog since now it was mentioned here in the presentation. There's many um, platforms. What do you recommend? Can anyone give me, you know, because I know you got Google blogs and you got a lot of them out there. What, what do you recommend as far as integrating that with my website and my uh, brand? What's your website on? What, your website uh, the, 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 yeah, my website is, is basically my product and services dealing with uh, financial literacy and uh, career consulting. Right. And, is it on WordPress? Uh, the, uh... No, it's it's on a Wix. My platform is on, on Wix. Wix. Yes. Okay. Well, usually, I mean, on the website platform, so Wix, you could do a blog right there. So essentially, yes. the blog could just be another page. Like, yeah, I okay. see you have an FAQ reviews and stuff like that. You can have a blog uh, on your menu or underneath one of your menus. And that, you know, you just, you it's a little bit different the way you usually do blogs is like a post and um, some websites do it as just pages. Um, mm -hmm. So you could do it right from Wix and, and just do it right there. Yes. Yeah, and Lawrence, yes. uh, the most important thing is, you know, you're building the footprint for your primary domain, right? If you have your your website here and your blog there, um, there's probably some pros and cons to it, but you got to think about, you know, is that putting all your eggs into that one basket and making that website as big as possible content wise. So um, I think what Pia said was right. Having your blog part of this platform that you're on and taking advantage of the mm -hmm. blog feature is going to be your easiest and best way to do what you're doing. Okay. All right. Thank you. And we still had one um, text question. Um, is Wikipedia a worse place to use for social media. Um, I'll, I'll take a crack at this and then I'll let Robert take it because I know he's got experience with it. But but you know the, the big thing you're trying to do is establish trust and credibility with your customers. So if you can provide factual information and provide it on Wikipedia and that links back to you or you link to it from your website, that's gonna help make you look like an expert in your industry. Robert? Okay. Yeah, and that's pretty much what I said, since I have more of a academic subject that deals in facts, which Wikipedia does, I'm able to use Wikipedia quite a bit and link it back to my website. Plus, as an editor of Wikipedia, I have my own um, editor page where I can say that I, you know, have X, Y, and, you know, I have Silphium Design and I can make a link on my own page going to uh, my Silphium site. And the, the backlink juice from Wikipedia is amazing. It's one of the highest you can get. So you can use Wikipedia. And also for my bed and breakfast, you can use Wiki Voyage, which uh, you can put out places of lodging. You can put out what you can see in various trips and you can all link it back to your website. And Arthur commented in the comments to use the Google EEAT guidelines, which is show your experience, your expertise, your authority, and your trustworthiness when you write. 
and that will help you rank higher in Google. That's the old formula. We don't know how it's changing with AI, but we expect that's still going to really weigh a lot. Okay. I think that's Perfect. it from the chat. All right. I think that's it. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for attending and staying with us to the end. Um, I think I've said it enough, but we're here to help you. And you have our directory link in the in the chat. I'll give you a few seconds to click that. And if you wouldn't mind, if you haven't already submitted that uh, survey, that would be very helpful. Uh, I can give you one more link while we're at it. I think there's a few more people here. Um, we are doing our next up and coming event um, next week. And I want to just do a quick link to that if anybody would like to join us for our next conversation. It's going to be more focused on generating leads and what you can do on your website to help get more uh, return of, or conversion or leads out of it. So I'll just put that here as my last uh, link. Give it a few seconds for everybody to click the links. Other than that, we wish you a really um, great rest of your day and week. And we thank you for being with here with us here. Thank you, thank Webheads, you. For, for your help. And we'll see you at an upcoming event or talk to you uh, if you schedule a call with us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks All right. Coming. Take care. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye now.